Okay, and it's five, four, three, two, one. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tell the Damn Story. This is the show that talks about the trials and uh, tribulations and celebrates the successes and failures of writing, especially our own failures, so that we might make your journey in creativity a little smoother. I'm Chris Ryan. I'm an award-winning hybrid author and micro-publisher. And to really bring Tell the Damn Story to fruition, what we need is a being of power. We need a being that Jack Kirby would have created if he hadn't been on the earth already. We need someone who has written characters from Scooby-Doo to uh, Batman, from Archie to his own uh, 1930s African-American soldier of fortune, Aaron Blackjack Day, what we need, who we need, the hero for our times. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Simmons. How are you, Alex? Who that? Who that? Who that? Oh, me. Yes. Hey, how you doing, Chris? How you doing, Chris? Good to see you. Good. And ladies and gentlemen, please, no great team ever works if one member of the team is 100% of the game. No, that's 50, 50, or 100, 100. My 100, 150, 50 is Mr. Christopher Ryan, who is a consummate uh, writer, a publisher, editor hard editor my god this man is tough <laughs> and an explorer <laughs> because after a brilliant career teaching hundreds of young people the the experience and the and the skills and the trials and tribulations helping them get through the trials and tribulations of becoming better at communicating through writing and some of them actually becoming writers he has after years of that he has actually now set off to explore other avenues of his own creative world, including acting and directing in films. So, Mr. Christopher Ryan, it is so good, so good, so marvelous, and so good again to be with you here today. Thank you, sir. You're very generous, bordering on fiction. All right, <laughs> so let's, let's talk about the topic for today, ladies and what gentlemen. What is the you... topic for today, Chris? Well, we all know that it's Oscar weekend, that Sunday night, Oscar's set to tell us what, who was best and all that sort of stuff. And we ain't making any predictions. No, we're not. Ah, that's not really what we're interested in. No. As a show that discusses writing and discusses creativity and how to improve your own, we thought we would look back at six films that won both Best Picture and Best Screenplay, either original screenplay or or adapted screenplay. And we would talk just briefly why it merits your a second look from you, maybe some study from you, and what it contributes to our study of what makes a great story. And that's what we're going to do today. By the way, I, I have to uh, point out, again, one of, one of the marvelous things about Mr. Ryan here is his dedication to research. And so for preparation, in preparation for this particular episode, I usually jump on the Wayback Machine, but this time Chris borrowed mine and went back from went back to 1970 and then came forward slowly you know, to about 2018 to formulate a list of exactly that, screenplays that won for both picture and screenplay, and came up with a list of 30, 30 yeah which we will include in as a drop or not a drop, my bad, <laughs> as a, a guide or something that you can click a link for in our comment section and, and yeah. take a look at your convenience. But 30 films between 1970 and 2018. Right. That now, that's somewhat somewhere around 50 years, 54 years. Not every year did the best screenplay winner also win Best Picture. That's why there's 30 out of 54. Mm -hmm. So even at that level, it's tough to, tough exactly. to do Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Chris, let's start off with, since this was your brainchild, yes. start off with you. Okay. What film, what year? All right, I have three, and it looks like I'm going to be traveling a la Alex Simmons back in time. <laughs> so I'm going to go with my most recent choice of the three to start off, all right? And that's in 2015. The film Spotlight won Best Screenplay and Best Picture. Now, if you don't remember, 
Spotlight was a film that focused on journalists who uncovered and dug deeply in and then exposed the immense amounts of the pedophilia that was going on in the Catholic Church over the decades. It unearthed staggering amounts of pedophilia and pedophilia complaints, and then it uncovered the um, pattern of just moving those pedof pedophile uh, priests to another parish, and it would happen again. They would move them. To so it was huge, a huge uh, news story when it happened, and then the film had to deal with, all right, how do we tell this story without immediately alienating people who are uncomfortable talking about pedophilia or at um, devout Catholics. How do we do this? So that is why I believe this movie is worth watching, not because of the pressing, pre pressing moral issue of the day, although that is has merits. You can't ignore that, right? Mm -hmm. But it's how they tackled the difficult terrain of getting people to empathize, to follow, to stay with the story, as even as it got more and more horrifying, when more and more evidence was brought out, how do you keep an audience? How do you not turn them off? And the key with that movie was the writers making the characters earn empathy. You had, God, I am now, I'm all flaking on the name. He plays the Hulk in the MCU. Um, oh, I, I wish you hadn't done that. <laughs> now I'm blanking, but I'll pull it up in a moment. Okay. Um, Ruffalo. Yes, Mark right. Ruffalo. He starts getting a thread. And in, a, in classic hero's journey, everyone's telling him, leave it alone. When he's pulling on that thread, everyone's telling him, leave it alone. And he's getting a little bit more information. The editor is saying, well, we don't have enough. We don't have enough. And they keep going and keep going. And there ultimately has to be that moment, that confrontation between Ruffalo and I think it's Michael Keaton, who was the, the editor there. And Ruffalo says the thing that we're all thinking deep in our head. They knew, meaning the church knew, mm -hmm. they knew for years and they kept hiding it and they allowed it to continue. They knew they ruined thousands and upon thousands of young people's lives and they just kept allowing it to happen. And it's the most moral opposite of what the church was supposed to be standing for. And that moment seals that heroic journey. It's that moment of do or die. Yeah, it is. And, and it that's is the character. That's the, in the beat sheets, that's the why factor. There's steps in a beat sheet for the structure of a film, mm -hmm. uh, certain beats. That's one of those major factors right there. Actually, I'll pull it up. It is why go forward. There's the big debate just before that. As you were saying, Ruffalo is constantly getting people telling him, no, don't, leave it alone, blah, blah, blah. We so, don't have enough to go. We don't have enough right, to print. Right. Yeah. So that's, and he's saying, but this and but that. So that's the big debate. But then at a certain point, with an avalanche of don't go any further before him, he has to go, why go forward? All right, I see why you're saying I shouldn't, but yeah. why should I? And that's that moment when he makes, when he recognizes why he should, and then he makes the big decision, yeah. which then that's where the film now is going to travel. It's going to go into that dangerous zone. I'm going to say one other thing about it. It occurred to me that it's a kind of a double David versus Goliath story, that trope. And I'm going to mention that with another film, but it's Ruffalo as David versus the Goliath of this huge newspaper that he works for that is not going to risk its reputation unless they have everything they need. But the reason they're not going to run, and this is, you think of that newspaper early in the film as that's the big the barrier, establishment. Yeah. That's yeah. the establishment, right? But yeah. then you realize that Keaton is the David and the Catholic Church is the Goliath. 
he knows that if his paper does, this huge global entity will seek to crush him or crush the newspaper. So it's a fascinating double opportunity to watch that double David and Goliath trope used exquisitely well. It's funny, too, because I just want to ask a question and then make a comment, too. So the question first is, do you feel that this was so powerful a moment from a literary standpoint, meaning the writing of this particular scene was so relevant and so powerful? Or do you think it was this powerful because it is based on a truth? I think it was a both and. But the more important thing, the writing, the writer watched and made sure that we saw Ruffalo's character again and again earn it and not let it go and know and let it bother him. And it was, we constantly see that it's the moral right thing to do, even though it's extremely inconvenient for everyone involved. And when he finally confronts, it's the truth that we, that has been bothering us the whole time. Public issue meets earned character moment. And that, this was adapted from real events. Yeah. I think it was the Boston Globe who broke this story. And, or the Wall Street Journal. We look forward to your cards and letters. Please, <laughs> but fact check us on this, right? To, to see that happen, many of us remembered it. To ha when that moment came, we had been on the ride, exp feeling the frustrations he felt. It's That's an obvious empathy. If you can get the reader, the public, the viewer, to feel the empathy for your character and to recognize the worthiness of that character's journey, mm -hmm. then you have that audience. And when Which that moment comes and ultimately they break the story, the wave of satisfaction, I, I still watch that and break into tears. And then the they put some words to describe what happened and how many people and all that sort of stuff. And it's just like the after waves crashing on mm -hmm. you. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That is well, that's how you do that one, ladies it, and gentlemen. It's interesting too, because now the comment I wanted to make was something that was not an Academy Award winner, but in a way traveled a similar pathway. Mm. Was he said, she said. Yeah. Because that, once again, is journalist following a story that is based on actual truth, happenstances, circumstances, situations that had been prevalent for decades. You want to go way back, you can go back hundreds of years. But in this particular case, this particular circumstance had been prevalent for decades. And the industry knew about it. And Joe and Jane Average suspected it, and some of them even knew that this kind of thing was going on, but it was not confronted until mm -hmm. this particular story just bulleted out, just exploded yeah. out there, and then to, to the point of the story, the articles, and then eventually the movie. And the film did win some awards, not Academy Awards, but it yeah. was nominated for like a Cinema for Peace Award, right. St. Louis Film Critics Association Award, yeah. Alliance of Women Film Journalists Award. So it was recognized, but it's the similar thing. It's what is the, the fourth estate supposed to do? And in yeah. the, some cases, it does it and it does it well. The Washington Post movie about the Pentagon Papers, mm -hmm. the all the president's men. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what awards they won. We've seen we up, see folks. this. We see this. I, I guess I'll call it a trope fairly often about trying to speak truth to power. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that going on in our current times, so it's still timely. You, you, are, we'll we'll do one more quick thing, then we'll jump onto your next one. Uh, just a, 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 oh, a I thought flicker. we'd go to your next one. But a, okay. a, fli a flicker, a flicker of the Wayback Machine, 1930s, Big Town, <laughs> which was a radio show about a city newspaper run by uh, the city editor, Steve Wilson. And initially, when the film was done of this, pro uh, this program, Steve was just hungry for the headlines and hungry for mm -hmm. subscribers and just selling papers, any stories, any kind of sensationalistic thing to do that. Until he goes through 
that that trial by fire thing and hits on a situation that forces pardon me that forces him to look at what this newspaper could really do for the city and for the community and for the people and eventually the turnaround is it starts to take on the monsters and starts to reveal corruption and things like that and that was his trial by fire that led to that decision so even from the 1930s forward there have been films that have taken on as you say this trope or this particular subject and it's always good uh, to remember that occasionally the news works okay right. so, alex what do you got what I got my man Gene Hackman and Roy Scheider in a, a film called The French Connection. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's funny. There are times when. That was in the 70s. Yep. There are times when films or movies change. Something happens in a movie and suddenly you realize films are not going to be what they once were. Somehow. This is a turning point. Uh, I feel one of those times was with Sean Connery in the first James Bond movie where he shoots a bad guy who is already disarmed and on his knees with his hands behind his mm -hmm. neck. So it's like heroes don't do that. They do now. So in yeah. French Connection, we had seen movies with the cops versus bad guys and for decades again. And what French Connection did was it brought in a grit and a realism and an intensity and almost a behind the curtain look at the kind of people we knew were police officers and that were flawed. And yet we needed them, or we were at least supposed to be rooting for them to take down the bad guys, the real quote unquote threats. And this character, Eddie Doyle, Popeye Doyle in the film played by Gene Hackman, it's flawed. You get the feeling from the way the script is written in the story that he came up blue collar, probably had some sense of growing up in a, a rough neighborhood. Maybe it wasn't poor, but definitely blue collar, working class family and white, very white, this, white, that. And so becoming a cop and seeing the underbelly of society more often than not, he had his attitudes about race. He had his attitudes about people, about scales and snitches and other cops and what you had to do to get the job done, which was theoretically, again, catching the bad guys, but inadvertently stepping on people along the way. Right. And so this was, again, this was another look at a characterization, again, the police officer in films who normally wasn't this gritty wasn't right, this right. real this you could buy into this character and he was obsessed once he got his teeth into the particular challenge of this film he was obsessed and the script the screenplay really does a marvelous job of painting new york city and these characters in such a way that and i was born and raised in the city i felt yeah that's new york it's there that is real that is so real and also instantly in the opening scene where it it changes or i'm sorry it cuts back and forth between the streets in in, in france where a piece of the story is taking place and new york and police officers going after their particular suspects at a particular time and it's just neatly done this juxtaposition of these two different police officers one who doesn't fare too well in his pursuit and then doyle who again becomes the lead character for the story the protagonist in the story and what his world is like and what he's willing to do to get the job done in this environment it immediately puts you into that world if you didn't set up the world and set up the characters with a sense of authenticity, we would not buy into so much of this movie. Yeah. So I thought this was really well done, and it did set the tone for a number of, shall we say, cop films, type of films, from that point forward. This film, and one that didn't win, <laughs> which was Bullet, really affected this kind of storytelling in the 70s. Oh, and that kind of grittiness continued throughout both for award winners or nominated films such as heat and non-nominated there's so many of them that you can feel the city whether it's new york city or chicago or whatever i remember 
The taking of Pelham one two three is also taking up, that's a, yeah that's really you get that city you it get still stands up as a, a wonderful New York City taxi driver was probably the darkest Scorsese really went to the dark end of that the Warriors went to the more absurd absurdist almost comical grittiness yeah. of it because uh, we went from the Bronx all the yeah. way to Coney Island tour, yeah tour New York City <laughs> yeah in the we in, hit three of the, the major craziest way. But you that that's a great example of French Connection of a really strong script meeting the right actor. Yeah. You oh, know? yeah. Because Jane Hackman doesn't get enough praise as uh, a blue collar working man's actor. And here is the role that just let all that fly. And we hadn't some people might say along on the waterfront was gritty and this and that. But there was still a movie quality to that film. Mm. This was well, one of the, the first time, time period it was done too. Yeah, you know, true, to think true, about yeah, true, true. But this movie was one of those. In the seventies was a unique time for filmmaking, where there was some grittiness and there was a, almost an indie feel, even though it was within the systems where they were able to catch that moment and make it a new cinema by not polishing it even heat as gritty as that it heat is polished and beautiful in a way that french connection will never be yep and it was not i love them both be. for their different yeah yeah right so, and, yeah, and great that's choice that's, that's thank you and that's the other thing i would say too is in a perfect storm of filmmaking to have a script that sets all that up a great circumstance great backdrop great mm -hmm. characters that are yeah. really real and have flaws and all that, to set that up in the script and then be fortunate enough or brilliant enough to hire the right actors, directors, cinematographers yeah. to bring that to life so that, yeah, you do wind up with two Academy Awards. Yeah, and if you get a chance to read that script, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see the grittiness the in the dialogue, but also in the description, in the action, and... It's great to look at that feel and then something like Heat, that script, also phenomenal movie, phenomenal script, but you'll see the subtle differences. Yeah and, yeah. and again, you put those in your arsenal, in your toolbox. This is how they did this, is how they did that. And, and when you're ready, you pull those tools out and use them yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You so what's We're, your next film, Chris? I'm going to go from 2015. I'm going to go back. This is Alex Sim is going to get excited because we're going back in time. I'm going to go back to 1991 and Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, this is one of those films that I was at the right age, right time. I had read the Thomas Harris novel before the movie. I actually had read Red Dragon and then Silence. So Red Dragon predates that and gives us a introduction of Hannibal Lecter, but we don't really see the full-on Hannibal until the Silence of the Lambs. And I was able to, in in the days of Scriptorama, I don't know if that's still a website, script-o-rama.com. Well, let's find out is, while you're talking. And you're studying screenwriting, you should have that accessible because you get your hands on a lot of scripts, and that's a great way to study. But I got a copy of The Silence of the Lambs. I think it was from them to tell you, don't arrest me. And I I always felt this, but I recently saw an interview with uh, Anthony Hopkins and Jodie Foster talking to each other, much like Alex and I are doing now, a Zoom situation. And both of them spent an impressive amount of time talking about how the film was on the page and that they filmed just about every, almost every word of it. And if you read the script, you really see it. Now, I had promised before that I would talk about David and Goliath. And this is another interesting application and refreshing of that trope. Jodie Foster is the David in this situation. And you would think that Hannibal Lecter has to be the Goliath, but no. <laughs> Hannibal Lecter, actually, in the hero's journey, would form the, the wise old teacher which is a real perversion of and freshening of that trope because he both challenges her, but also teaches her and comes to respect her. The Goliath is this tiny little 
Jodie Foster character working her ass off to earn the FBI and to prove herself because of what haunts her. The silence of the lambs is what she's looking for because what she hears in her head is a trauma from her childhood when the lambs were screaming while they were being slaughtered. A brilliant character development from Thomas Harris, but the screenplay, adapted screenplay, it's really easy to go off what worked and to put your own thumbprint on them. I I show my frustration at DC movies, meaning DC comic-based movies, mostly because there's thumbprints all over it. And it shies away and makes things... When all of a sudden, Batman, who for 70 years has refused to kill, has got guns everywhere, then you know you're off the reservation and you have lost the quality that brought you there. Mm -hmm. Silence of the Lambs is true to that quality, but then takes that whole novel and turns it into a tight, efficient, organic-feeling two hours. I don't know, it might be two hours, ten minutes, who knows... Yes, Jodie Foster, was, her performance was fantastic. Anthony Hopkins, his performance was fantastic. But both of them say it's on the page. And having read the script, it is. Well worth your time, worth trying to find it and read it. If you're going for your master's thesis, then read the book, then read the script, then watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, it was worth the time. I had to mention that. I, I will concur with you on that, and I have the script in front of me right now. And again, one of the things I wanted to point out as we went through this particular episode is really the first three to five minutes of any movie is the appetizer of any banquet. And if folks are going to stay around for the whole meal and the cigar afterwards, whether you smoke or not, then <laughs> those first three to five minutes have to work. They have to pull you in. They have to give you a little bit of exposition, a little bit of character to introduction and development, and definitely recognize the conflict. Because in a moment, the ma the match is going to light, the fuse is going to be lit, and we're mm -hmm. going to be rolling. And you want to see what happens to these characters. And yeah. in the beginning of Silence of the Lamb, we are teased, in a way, by the situation that we see this protagonist, the Jodie Foster character, uh, protagonist placed in a dangerous situation. The way we are seeing it is someone's in trouble, screaming. Our character has her gun out. So we know, okay, the way she's handling herself in this scene, she is trained in something, i.e. police officer, military. We don't know fully. But as it progresses, we realize that she's going to someone's aid and it's a dangerous scenario. And as that, I'm not going to spoil it for anybody, as she kicks in the door and she's thrust into this situation, instantly you're guessing as to how this is going to go. And instantly there's a flip. I think we could talk about that part. I, I don't, I, I, we don't give things away. And I, what I do want to say, the, the, the movie's finish, from 1991. Just to, finish my, just to finish my, <laughs> hey, there are people who haven't seen it. Just to finish my analogy though. It's just it is just that thing that happens in those first two minutes of the film that actually say, buckle up, because we're going to keep doing this to you throughout the film. What you think you know, you're going to have to question or you're going to realize you were wrong here, there, here, there, throughout much of the film. It plays with you the same way that the Hannibal Lecter character is training her, but also plays with her and some of the other characters. I, I would add those opening minutes. Also, foreshadow everything that happens in the film. Yeah. You That's see her, I'm she's right. running by herself. She's a loner. Mm -hmm. You see the others going in a different direction. That That will pay off later on. You see her called the scene that you're talking about. That pays off later on. Mm -hmm. And then she's called to see her supervisor. And she winds up in an elevator with all these huge guys. And she's not even up to their shoulders. And how she has to 
position herself. And that struggle in that, it it reflects the script so well. And then also puts us into the subtext and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, really, you, you want a scene to do more than one thing. Mm. And this is a great script to study because every single scene does more. There's what's going on. There's what's meaning underneath. And then what it symbolizes all the way through. So it's well worth your time. And as what, you just pointed out, also, it's an excellent example of putting in what you might call them clues. You might call them teasers or elements that pay off down the line, that set you up for a payoff later in the film. And that's a craft in and of itself to be able to do that. And as Chris and I have talked about it countless times, rewrites are your friends. You don't have to pull it all together in the first draft or in that rough draft, as so many aspiring and emerging writers tend to think. It's got to be, it's got to be right the moment I click the keys. No, that's it, getting it out of your head and learning yeah. what's the story I'm trying to tell. Yeah. And from that point, you get to begin to craft it. And so some of the things we're talking about, yeah. really, who knows how many drafts this screenplay went through before it became what, what was utilized on the set, let alone whatever rewrites might have occurred on set, let alone whatever the director and the actors brought to the table. What's your next film, sir? Oh, my next film is Dances with Wolves. Uh, yes. Because um, it is interesting. There are some actors who have decided at some point in space and time I have a project, a passion project, or a project that's exciting, fun to me that I want to do, and I'm going to try and get it done as a film, and then I'm going to act in it. And then there are others who say, I'm going to act and I'm going to direct in it. And then there are those who go off on a whole tangent. And this one is a Kevin Costner extravaganza, which I think was his first, if I'm right. It was a big film, an ambitious film. It was a film that also was dealing with the treatments of indig indigenous people here in America back in the days of the Old West and the Civil War and all that. And it's the kind of story that has been told hundreds of times from a particular point of view. And usually that's from the Caucasian male POV. And here was Costner coming in and saying, I want to do a film that's going to be told, yes, white male in, in is a protagonist in the story, but is actually that person, that character is going to be wrapped within the blankets of the indigenous people that he is interacting with and the lifestyle that was. And I think the screenplay reflects that ambition. I think it reflects a certain degree of respect and authenticity that we had not seen in these types of films, certainly major films, prior to this one. And I do remember at the time that the film was being done, and even for a while afterwards, as it was being reviewed and so forth, there was a lot of poking at it. Like, Why do you have to do this film? And it's ambitious, and he's an actor, and it's this and that. It was almost like... How dare he? Yeah, please fail. Please, this guy's got to fail. This has got to fail. This has got to fail. And then, of course, it did as well as it did. And so now the spotlight was thrown on him for anything else that he did. <laughs> you can't make a mistake after that. Of course, there were some, and then they, he got hammered for it. But like I was saying, this screenplay, I think, really did, from my point of view, really did approach the subject matter and the material and the characters with a sense of authenticity and a sense of respect and a true effort to try and tell this particular story well. And in terms of opening and putting you in the world and introducing you to your lead protagonist, mm -hmm. this also does that very effectively and very efficiently because instantly we're, and I'm gonna give this much away in the opening, we're in a war area. It's the, it's the old West kind of situation where civil war or or even the war between the, the, the soldiers and the Indians at that, the Native Americans at that time. But in particular, in the civil war kind of thing, where if you were 
anywhere where a cannon exploded or cannon shells exploded or things like that or, or dynamite went off and you were badly wounded, you would lose limbs like that. And it right. was, it's a carnage more than just injured people. It was carnage. And so we're thrust into that environment instantly. There's an ugliness and a rawness and a vulnerability to what we're about to experience. And, in, and they set it up instantly. And they have our lead character in that circumstance, not as a doctor, but as one of the wounded. And what happens to him and what he does and what choices he makes at that point immediately start to tell you something about this character. And it justifies or signals what direction he's possibly going to go in for the rest of the film. And certainly when he makes certain choices later in the film, you can hark back to this and go, yeah, the guy who did that thing at the beginning, yeah, this is something that he would do here. So there's a consistency to the character, even though the character goes on this journey and changes grows, learns, whatever you want to call it, by the end of the film. It's well mapped out, and multiple characters are well mapped out and interact in a very satisfying manner. True. I would only add one thing, and that is that another thing the script does, and in action more than dialogue, it allows the character to be laughed at or to amuse others mm. without him gaining anything. And later on, you realize that those little things by increments won, he won people over, but he wasn't, he didn't even realize he was being seen or being watched when he did the thing that actually named the movie. And there are other times when he fails at just trying to do things that he's new to that idea, that rounded character, a character who can fall on his face or her face or their face. It does a lot to enhance and round the character out and make that character someone we can embrace. And what a character does when you when it that character is painted in the corner, to quote Robert McKee, that choice that they make shows you whether they have a good heart, good soul, or good moral center or not. And we see that at the beginning, and we see that throughout. Yeah. And, and again, we're not going to name any of the films that are up for consideration now, but I can see a, a slight structural parallel between this film and one that is up right now, and it's the exploration of a people that are not always in the spotlight, that are not always at the top of mind for our society and that there are more myths and stereotypical portrayals out there to get your hands on than what would be considered even remotely authentic. So I find that this film, again, in terms of its efforts to respect the people of the film, the communities that, that he moved through and his character being willing to learn, to actually find out what he doesn't know and adapt to that or embrace that or at least understand it better i think is another another plus for the script and then the way the film was shot and portrayed just again it's one of those again perfect storms yep i agree okay. said so thank you All sir. Right, my last one my last one again we'll put a smile on your face because i'm going even further back <gasps> This is 1972. Woo! And we're going to discuss The Godfather. Yes, yes. Not from the casting, not from the director, not from all the scenes that, oh my God. That I... And not from the music. That, that the author of the book, The Godfather, Mario Puzo, was allowed to write the script and that didn't blow up in their faces. That's worth noting. Nobody knew these characters as well as Mario Puzo. And it is very difficult for an author to take his expansive novel or her or their expensive, expansive novel and boil it down to movie size. And he did an exceptional job. And one of the reasons was he knew the beats. You were talking about beat sheet before. Mm -hmm. He knew the beats he had to hit 
because of the challenges he was playing with. This is a gangster movie told from the gangster's point of view. This is not about cops trying to hunt down the evil. This is about the moral code of outlaws versus a corrupt America at a perfect time where we were going through Watergate and the Vietnam War and we were starting to see that, wait a minute, maybe things aren't as perfect as we were told. There's always that moment in every child's life where the gods that they live with, mom, dad, or mom and dad, or mom and mom, or dad and dad, whatever, all of a sudden something happens that shows that child, wait a minute, mommy's human, daddy's just a regular person. Mm. And here, Huzo was doing this amazingly detailed family saga but the subtext of it is who has the morals and who is corrupt. And there are no pure, maybe the a Diane Keaton character, maybe, but there are no pure heroes in this. So this is where we first start seeing, we've seen them throughout literature, mm. so I'm uh, inaccurate to say that. But as far as films are concerned, this is one of the biggest ones that that puts anti-heroes as protagonists. In the old days of Jimmy Cagney, something like White Heat, he was an anti-hero, but he got his. Mm -hmm. In this movie, when any anyone gets, it's because of a rival gang. It's not comeuppance. It's not justice. And it's a whole different and more complicated set of morals code and criminal behavior on many sides so it became a, a much more expansive to paint with or to to get all of that tightly done and as always Uzo uh, did what i always they did he served the story over any pressure to get a pure hero and he let the characters reveal organically through action and some dialogue, but who they were and who had the morals and what the morals were. So this is a really intricate and meaty feast for study. Not because it's a classic attack. It's just... <laughs> it, do, it The Godfather is what it is because of first and foremost the book and then the screenplay so to go all the way back before the director before the casting before all the beautiful shots and just see the words on the page and realize how much is achieved there is worthy of study and that's what i have to offer i'm sorry i gotta jump in the way back machine again I just have to. I just have to. It's a way back day. <laughs> way back day. Just on my mind. Anyway, and you that's mentioned why Alex Simmons was never in a musical. All right, go ahead. <laughs> you mentioned White Heat with Jimmy Cagney, and that my mind immediately phew, to Dead End, a movie that was made in 1937 with Humphrey Bogart, Joel McRae, Jimmy Cagney, and Pat O'Brien. There you go. And All the star dead, cats for that day. And the dead end kids were these slum kids living in Hell's Kitchen, New York. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Cagney played this tough gangster character who was like uh, a role model to these slum kids. And Pat O'Brien and Jimmy Cagney, they had grown up together in the same neighborhood. One becomes a gangster, the other becomes a priest. Because that's and what the, happened those days. Right. <laughs> nice Irish families. And the thing that, that gets me is, and this is one of where I will give away the end. What? Because Some it's people 1937. May not have seen it. <laughs> yeah. If you haven't seen it, too damn bad. <laughs> too damn bad. But, so Alex Simmons has a 50 to 70 year uh, cutoff line. Yeah. If you're more than 50 years old as a film, he can tell you the ending. Here we go. So here's the thing. It's you were talking about moral codes and gangsters versus gangsters in, in, in The Godfather and corrupt this and all that. 
And one of the things is that they're trying to reach these slum kids because they finally get the gangster. They finally get Cagney's character. He's a killer in all this. So they capture him. They try him. They convict him. He's going to be executed. No and he's remorse. a tough guy. He's a tough, you know, he's no not going to play scared. He's not going to do any of that. He's going to go, kill me. I'm No big deal. I'm, I'm, I'm who I am. And the kids yeah. are like, they're going to listen to it on the radio. They're going to listen to for that announcement that he was executed. And they still want to be just like him. They want to go out just like him. And Pat O'Brien spends a, a last visit with the character, with Cagney's character. And they talk about redemption and about souls and things like that. And of course, Cagney's still saying, hey, I know what I did. I know who I am. Not a problem. And O'Brien lets him understand it. Yeah. And as you go out with this attitude... All those kids are going to follow want to follow right behind you, right behind you, and not just behind you to the point of where they become big deals in the gang world, but they're also going to be walking this path that you're walking. Mm -hmm. And he says, so what do you expect me to do about it? And he says, basically, show fear. Yeah, go yell up, go yell up. Go yell up, right? For the and kids, go yell up. Cagney's yeah. character isn't going to do it. No, he says, no, that's not me. I'm not doing it. And so sure enough, the time comes, they're going to walk him to the electric chair and the kids are in the little basement clubhouse of theirs and they're listening on the radio and all of this. And he gets into the room and he's still, and they strap him in the chair. And then he s starts begging for his life and crying. And they execute him. And the kids hear what he did, what? And of course, they're now their idol has fallen. Yeah. And you get the feeling because it's 1937, it's got to have a, you know, sort of a button on the end of it that says there's hope. You get the feeling that they went, damn, then, then what am I thinking? What, what was I, what, what, what the hell am I? And they're left with that. Maybe that's not the road to go down. And again, it's not that the cops stopped him and, and crime has been defeated and, and the good guys win as much as this criminal. We get the feeling, we get the feeling that his character thought about what his friend had said yeah. and made that choice. That right. had that moment not happened between those two men, he would have gone out yeah. no biggie. Sure. Right. And then hey, Pat O'Brien's character reminds Cagney that he had met those kids. Yeah. And to have that last moment where you do something for others, that whole subtext of you can redeem yourself even mm -hmm. in the final seconds. By the way, this was nominated for an Academy Award, not yeah. for, best, for best picture, not necessarily for best screenplay. Yeah. The other thing, because we talked about the dead end kids, it's a great little thing that those same actors who play the dead end kids wound up being having a series of short mm -hmm. and longer films as the dead end kids or as the Bowery, Bowery boys, boys or yeah where he side they actually did some good routine five and they would fight yeah. the, the bad guys <laughs> and stuff so yeah. in a subtle way i always loved that that kind of show that cagney's moment of generosity at the end of his life did some good. And by the way, that uh, would have been that, an, that would have been an adaptation. Had it won best screenplay, that would have been best adapted yeah. uh, story because it was based on a Broadway play that became the film. There you go. There you go. Now so, you have one more film, sir. Yeah, I I do I do, and it's funny because I'm thinking about one, but I'm going to go with the other. I'm going to go with, and this very brief. I'm going to go with Twelve Years a Slave. Okay. Right. Oh, that's and, a hard watch. Oh my God. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. It which just is just rip your heart out over and over. Which is one of the reasons why I'm going to be brief here because what this film does, I feel in a way, speaks to some of the things we've talked about prior with the other choices. There are these moments again in 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 the course of movie making. Sometimes it's a decade thing. Every decade mm -hmm. something shifts. But there are these moments when certain movements in film shift the paradigm or shift the direction or kicks open a door and says, this is now possible. This is now the new bar that you have to you know, try and, and rise to. 
And they're back in, in the 80s, 80s, it was Roots that the TV series, a multi episode late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, which was based on Alex Haley's book, which took us back to the days of slavery and mm -hmm. what some of those relationships were like. And because of what had happened in real life in the 60s with the civil rights movement and things like that, these stories were starting to get told. And in some ways, it has been said numerous times, and I'm going to get back to the script in a second. In some ways, it's been said numerous times that one of the reasons that the civil rights movement worked as well as it did was because of media. Finally, people could be sitting in their homes in Nebraska or in Paris and look at their television set and see the abuse and see the beatings and see the dogs being set loose on people. Just could see the brutality and want to go, oh, hell no. Wait a minute. You mean this does go on? And so that was one of the things that media was there. And I feel that 12 Years a Slave was one of those films that said, okay, you've had Sounder. And you've had a couple of other films where you've gone back to the plantation and all that. But we haven't really shown you how just how brutal yeah. it really can be. It really was. And I think that this one was one of those films that said, okay, here's the truth. Whether you want to see it or not, and black or white, doesn't matter the audience. Whether you want to see this or not, here it is. And it's it even opens up with a scene of an animal pen. So that's the first scene of yeah. the film, because what were blacks seen as, what were slaves seen as in right. those days, but livestock, cattle in a way, property. And to understand that we're going to show you exactly where these human beings sat on the scale of value in, in the eyes of certain powers that be at that time and what they really had to go through. We're gonna put it out there, and we're gonna put it out there in such a way that you can turn away from it, but you can't. You've seen it now, mm -hmm. it's already in your head. It's like the, I'm sorry, it's a, a horrible uh, comparison, but it's like the crucifix scene in, in, the, um, in the horror film, which I just, as I started to say, it went out of my head, not the omen. Uh, the exorcist. Yes. Okay. It's like that moment. The moment it's there and you realize you want to look away. It's too late. It's already in there. Or Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Yeah. You, you, he really showed all the pain that uh, Christ was supposed to have gone through. Mm -hmm. And in a way that will change Holy Week for Christians forever. It ain't about skipping meat. It's, it is much more graphic. And that's yeah. what 12 Years a Slave did. Slavery was no longer a concept. It was, here's the brutal reality. And because, and this is a, a thing that when I talk to my students, and it's not always about traumatic scenarios like this. Sometimes it can be a love story. Sometimes it can be a, a conversation between a, a father and, and and son or a mother and daughter or, or reverse those. Right. There's a difficult conversation. There's a difficult time in their life. There's a traumatic situation. But I often say, what's your truth? What are you trying to say with the film or your story? What are mm -hmm. you trying to get across to us? Who are these characters? How do you want your audience to feel? What do you want us to take away from this experience? Mm -hmm. And I feel like, the authors in this film, in this with this screenplay, said, I'm going to take you there, and I'm going to take you there as authentically and as completely as I possibly can, because some of you already know this, but you haven't seen it, and some of you are denying it, and you need to, that needs to be made more difficult for you to do, and some of you will see this and continue to deny it, but the image is going to be in your head anyway. Mm-hmm. And I think if you commit to your goal, to the bullseye at the end of that trail, and you aim for it, and you do it honestly and authentically, then you wind up with a film like this, which is brutal, which is painful to watch. And second only, I think, being there and understanding that situations like this still exist in this day and time in other countries. Yeah. So uh, there's pockets of our country. 
Yeah, I'm. I believe know? me, I'm not ignorant of that. Right. I'm just. The reality is that human beings are capable of some heinous things, and here's a film that didn't back down from that, or here's a screenplay that didn't back down from telling right. that story, and then a film that said, "Okay, this is the truth that we are now going to try and produce." in this medium yeah let's go it, for it. it would be really interesting uh as an exercise for a writer to watch the film right experience all of that and then go back and read the script that's a tall order to ask because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but to see with it fresh in your mind how much of it is actually on the page and then how it was put on the page when you can start to see how you know how to um express and and or convey the not for the best way you know not for our betterment but some of the keystone things that molded this country there's a whole section of the country that wants to say that we're perfect and we've always been perfect and that section doesn't want us to study these things but you gotta you gotta and if you really want to be a writer that can write truth you gotta look how others handled difficult truths the bitter truth yeah. everything from humor to horror yeah, you know, is is out there for you. It's as a writer, you want to go for quality and consistency, no matter what the genre, no matter what the medium is that you're working in. But in particular, in stories like in where where you're dealing with real life situations that you're reflecting, yeah. or you do something again, like he he said, she said, or some of the other films, you really have to be able to get into the head of the characters. And, yeah, and but that's done by writing and rewriting and yeah. discovering what you're writing about mm -hmm. you know, I, and I'm running it 60. by people who know better than you about some of those circumstances yeah. that you can fine tune it and get the nuances in there because ultimately our job as writers is to convey a story to the best of our ability so that we can share it with others and they can find their way through that story and gain yes. something from it whether it's pure entertainment or information or awareness that's our job and i'm sorry did you have a th another screenplay no i have another comment though oh you know, okay fine no the, but i just the I, last didn't wanna, thing. I didn't want to yeah. suddenly take up more time okay. and then you got another screenplay to go through the yeah. last thing is that a good writer in rewrites in rewriting will find the threads that have not been tied up mm -hmm. organically and to make the piece a whole and we have one that'll be hanging and distracting and knocking us out of knocking the viewers here out of this episode while they think and think so we're gonna i'm gonna ask the question and hopefully you'll answer it so that the thread is tied in people are gonna be thinking what was the other one that alex was considering <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> the sting ah the sting yes the sting. and very briefly why would that be worthy of study it's funny because again they're scoundrels our heroes mm -hmm. our protagonists in this film are scoundrels they're con men and very good at what they do and it's about the characters again it's very much about the characters there's almost the the wise teacher and the young upstart mm -hmm. in terms of again you mentioned that with the silence of the lambs and there's lessons to be learned life lessons to be learned there's how the characters develop over time and their relationship how that connects and there's a payoff because there's a, someone does get their come up it's right. and how that happens and it's not about the police coming in or the authorities coming in and making everything right again it's about a code among the scoundrels right. and the rules among the shysters and, and the cheats and the criminals that you don't break. And if you do break it, then there's a debt to be paid. And right. so it's an interesting way. And yet it's it the, the film has some you know minor brutal moments, 
but it's got a lighthearted humor to it. Yeah. And yet it's got some really genuine, enjoyable characters to to experience. So the that was Scott crazy. Joplin piano music helped the lightness. Yes. But it, it's also a great teachable moment. How do you make scoundrels likable? Yep. Hit them against bigger scoundrels. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. All right. Yeah, so and now there are so many people sitting out there saying, Oh, I feel so much better than I know <laughs> that now. I was just dying to know what Alex Simmons thought. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they were. <laughs> but anyway, this is this was our, our moment to reflect on again screenplays that won best screenplay and best picture yep. Academy Awards. And there you go. As it's we said before, twist. out of 50 some odd years, 54 years, I believe you said, yeah, we 54. picked 30 titles. We looked at 30 titles and we picked out of those 30. Well, out of the 54, only 30 hit that criteria. Right, exactly. Winning the best picture and the best. And out of those 30, we picked our particular selections to talk about today. That's right. As There's I said, we'll, there to study. we'll leave the list. In uh, available for you to download if you want. Uh, I'll, I'll make that possible. And uh, especially those of you who are going to be on our Facebook page, it'll be there for you to download. Mm. And um, also on our YouTube page, I'll make that available to you as well. So you should visit our Facebook page and our YouTube page, in particular our YouTube channel, because what the heck? We got over 300 other episodes for That's you right. to check out. Yeah. It would be great to ask people to look at that list, you know, maybe on the Facebook page. And of these, which one would you recommend aspiring writers to read and view? It would be interesting to get the audience's view on that. So I, maybe, I maybe we can get concur. that done. I would concur. As a matter of yeah. fact, I'd also be interested in knowing what were their favorite films anyway? Because, you know, it's, it's, that's another question. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, of the list, what would what Chris said, what yeah. would you Recommend. There we are, our non-prediction, Oscar-related, Oscar-adjacent episode of Tell the Damn Story, and how right. you can use the Oscars to help you tell your damn story. Damn. Right. And by the way, just as Chris is known to say at the end of almost every one of our episodes. Oh, yes, always. And subscribe. Yes. It helps us help you, helps us help you. That's right. Or some, maybe that needs a rewrite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll work on that. And again, enjoy the day, the week, the, the month, the year, whatever the heck it is. You know, keep on writing. And if you have some topics or subjects that you'd like us to talk about or explore, please do. And keep an ear and an eye up because we have a cavalcade of interviews that we're lining up for the coming months writers who will share their wisdom and experiences as well so stay with us, oh, be yeah. with us. and chris as always a pleasure peace oh, take bye care bye, everybody. everybody peace thanks bro